Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve, and I will be moderating our conversation today during the statewide telephone town hall with Congressman Chris Pappas and Congresswoman Annie Custer as we discuss the federal and state response to the coronavirus. During the call today, if you would like to ask a question live with our panel, please press star three. Again, please press star three if you'd like to ask a question. Joining Congressman Pappas and Congresswoman Custer today will be Dr. Michael Calderwood. Dr. Calderwood is the Associate Chief Quality Officer at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and is also a system epidemiologist and infectious disease expert. Also on the line today is Greta Johansson. Greta is the District Director of the New Hampshire District Office of the United States Small Business Administration. Again, both members of Congress would like to hear your questions today, and we would like to get to as many of you as possible today during our conversation. During the call, simply press star three on your keypad to ask your question. With that, I'll turn it over to Congressman Women Custer for opening remarks. Uh, Congressman Pappas, would you like to go first? Sure, I'm happy. I'm, no, I'm happy to. I, I want to thank thank all the um, uh, folks from across the state of New Hampshire who have joined us on this call. Uh, I want to thank my colleague Annie Custer as well as uh, Dr. Calderwood and Greta Johansson from the Small Business Administration for joining us as well. Uh, this is a deeply concerning time for all of us in New Hampshire and across this country, and so I thank you for spending some time with us to talk a little bit about what we have been doing in Washington, but also what we've been doing here in New Hampshire uh, to try to work hand in glove on a whole of government response uh, at the state, local, and federal level. Um, and also to be mindful of our public health community, uh, our medical providers, uh, those who are on the front lines of this crisis and who, who are doing a tremendous job each and every day to keep us safe. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the longer term implications of what this pandemic means for New Hampshire, and that is the serious economic dislocation that we are already seeing in our communities as a result of this virus. Uh, we have had record numbers of folks seeking unemployment help. We've had small businesses who have had to close in our state. Um, this is something that we're going to be dealing with for quite a long time, um, even once we have fully addressed uh, the public health threat that coronavirus faces. So um, there is certainly a lot to talk about, and I think we're taking this very seriously and want to ensure that uh, we're bringing all the experts to bear for the people of New Hampshire to help answer your questions. Um, we held a town hall just a couple weeks ago in the same format, and uh, we had a great response and also a great engagement from folks across our state who asked lots of questions about the public health issues that we were just seeing the leading edge of, frankly, at that time. Uh, in Washington, we have been passing legislation uh, that's seeking to address the situation that we're in. Uh, we passed an initial $8.3 billion in federal funds that are going to back up the state and local response, and that's so crucial to make sure that uh, New Hampshire can do all it needs to do to protect its citizens and save lives. Uh, we also passed last week, and the Senate uh, just passed it this week, the President has signed it into law, our Families First Act, which focuses on ensuring that testing is free, uh, making sure that uh, individuals have access to uh, paid uh, sick leave and an expanded uh, family medical leave that deals with the situation that we're all in. Uh, the bill also strengthens unemployment benefits and expands food assistance, which is so crucial. But there's obviously going to be so much more that we have to do. Uh, and so we hope to be back at it again next week, dealing with an economic stimulus package that doesn't look at necessarily big industries, but looks at our main street businesses, our working families, and individuals who have been adversely impacted by this crisis, and how we can allow them to continue to deal with their financial obligations, uh, keep their doors open in the long term, uh, make sure that our families can deal with the economic pressures that they're facing. That is absolutely so crucial. So there are a number of ideas that are on the table uh, there, and we will probably get into those in more detail on the call, uh, but do know that uh, we are taking this very seriously. We understand the long-term impacts that this is going to have for our economy. Um, just yesterday, I called on the Small Business Administration to make available zero-interest loans for our businesses who are facing economic challenges and to look to improve lending terms um, so that businesses who are hard hit can get access to emergency funding. And I was pleased yesterday that SBA announced an emergency declaration for New Hampshire, which opens access to more resources to help our businesses uh, weather this particular storm. Um, we're also um, going to be working closely with our public health officials. Uh, we have been hearing a lot 
uh, from our hospitals and providers across New Hampshire who are concerned about uh, a lack of supplies, a shortage of supplies. Uh, we continue to need to see uh, more access to testing for individuals who need it so that we can understand exactly where we stand and how we can protect vulnerable populations in our state. So it's incredibly important that we all do our part, that we engage in social, social distancing, uh, that we use good hygiene, that we're washing our hands constantly, that we're not gathering in groups, and that we stay home to slow the spread of this virus and to bend the curve in the right direction. I think we all need to take to heart the words of Dr. Fauci and others at the federal level who are helping to lead this response effort, um, who have told us that when it appears like we're going overboard, then we're just beginning to do enough to make sure that we're saving lives and prevent this pandemic from um, you know, becoming uh, even more serious than it already is for us all. So we do all have to do our part uh, and recognize that we're all in this together. And I just wanna remind everyone that our congressional office is uh, open for essential cons constituent services. And if you need us, you can call us at 285-4300 or go to our website at pappas.house.gov. Um, avoid in-person visits and uh, just give us a call or send us a message online, and we're happy to work with you on anything that's of concern. So once again, thank you. I look forward to your questions, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Annie Custer, for some comments. Great, Chris. Well, thank you. It's um, good to be with you and to have everyone on the line. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and I'm particularly pleased that we have one of the state's leading epidemiologists here with us, uh, Dr. Michael Calderwood works in infectious disease and he can be an expert source for your questions about um, COVID-19 and the spread of the illness and how you can protect yourself and your family. And we also, Greta Johansson has joined us from the United States Small Business Administration and as Chris referenced, we know that there's going to be substantial economic dislocation. We've already seen with the governor's order about the closing of bars and restaurants. Uh, small businesses that are at risk, and we expect um, that will continue. Uh, we will also be able to respond to questions regarding applying for unemployment benefits. Um, and if you go to either of our websites, uh, either the Custer website or the Pappas website, you'll be able to uh, get access to the information on how best to apply for unemployment benefits or uh, small business um, relief. So I want to ensure you that as this develops, that you will be receiving up-to-date information about our efforts to protect public health and to support our small business community and support jobs across the state. As, as Chris Pappas referenced for the past several weeks, uh, we have been in frequent contact with our governor, Chris Sununu, our top public health officials around the district, leadership at the Manchester and White River Junction VA Medical Centers. Uh, I was on a call with all of our hospitals. Um, I did another conference call with our nursing homes, and then we did an extensive conference call um, with the agencies and associations representing uh, childcare, mental health, addiction recovery, all of the various social safety net or organizations around the district. And we are troubleshooting to make sure that they get the resources that they need uh, to keep their doors open, that they are nimble in uh, how they can protect their own staff while still serving the clientele and constituency around the state of New Hampshire. I think Chris and I both we're glad to see that the governor has taken important steps to protect Granite Health, uh, Granite Staters from both the health and economic risks of COVID-19, um, certainly expanding unemployment insurance, transitioning New Hampshire schools to online learning, and again, as I mentioned, closing down the bars and restaurants where people tend to congregate in groups. The past, this past weekend, uh, we worked late into the night, Friday night, uh, finally passed the package that Chris referenced, a bipartisan bill to provide additional support on top of the original $8.3 billion in federal funding. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act that I understand was just signed into law by the president um, will ensure, first of all, that COVID-19 tests are cost-free we want to make sure that people have access to paid 
sick leave so that they won't go to work if they're not feeling well. Um, expands emergency family and medical leave as well. So if there's someone sick in the family that people will not be going to work. Provides enhanced unemployment insurance as we've referenced. And importantly, bolsters food security for American families, children, and seniors. Um, we know that there are thousands of children across the state who uh, get access to nutrition through school lunch and uh, breakfast and lunch programs. And so we are working mightily to make sure that food is accessible um, in every community for children and uh, families and seniors in need. So one thing that I do want to say in a positive light, passage of these two bills do demonstrate uh, that the Democrats, Republicans, and the administration can work together with face with a serious challenge. And I think time is of the essence, and we need to work very, very quickly. Um, just a couple of things on the third package that Chris Pappas referenced about direct financial support to American workers small businesses and families. Uh, less, yesterday I led a bipartisan letter to our leadership in the House and Senate to express the urgent need to support rural communities and rural health care providers. Uh, we are requesting additional resources because our rural communities face unique challenges when it comes to access to health care and these challenges are exacerbated by the current public health crisis. Um, earlier this week, I also wrote to the director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection to take measures to protect consumers from unreasonable price increases in home health products during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also want to work with the air and travel companies to resolve outstanding refunds in a timely manner. So in the coming weeks, we will be considering additional legislation to expand paid sick leave benefits. Uh, just yesterday, I co-sponsored legislation to do that for hourly workers and be working with our colleagues um, to make sure that workers who lack paid sick leave get access to that so that no one would be placed in the decision making of whether to go to work or take home take care of themselves at home and protect the public from the spread of the disease. So with that, that's a good point to turn it over to Dr. Michael Calderwood, who can help us to understand uh, the projection of the disease going forward and why uh, some of these extraordinary measures that have upended our lives are so necessary to protect uh, to protect you and your family and your community. Dr. Caldwell, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the, the time to just share a little bit of the conversations we're having in the, the healthcare space. I want to give just a, a bit of an update, and obviously the numbers are changing every day, but um, at the most recent count, there were over 250,000 cases of COVID-19 worldwide with over 14,000 cases in the United States. And if we look specifically at the state of New Hampshire, there were 44 known cases as of yesterday, but we're having new positives being reported each day. And the expectation is that this number will actually increase and increase by a significant amount over time. People always ask, do we know the actual ultimate number of cases, and, and we don't. There are many variables that go into that. There are some models that have been uh, reported saying that about 50% of the world population could be infected by the end of the pandemic, but it's important to recognize that the vast majority of those individuals will either have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. And really what we need to do is flatten the curve or bend the curve, as was mentioned earlier, and these policies that have been put in and are really quite drastic but critical, the closures of schools, restaurants and bars, the restricting of large gatherings, thinking about opportunities for telecommuting or working from home, and probably um, top of my list, really focusing on staying home when you're sick or self-isolation. The estimate is that those measures can actually reduce the infected population as low as 20%. And that is a huge reduction. If we think about the symptoms that people are having, 
It's typically fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. There are some other symptoms that have been reported, but it's important to remember that isolated upper respiratory symptoms, such as runny nose, sinus congestion, and sore throat, often suggest a different illness than COVID-19, and there are a number of respiratory viruses that are still circulating uh, at this time. If we look ahead, what we really are beginning to focus on is the hospital capacity for the expected increase in patients. What we think is that about one in five who are infected may require hospitalization, and one in 20 may require care in an intensive care unit. And, you know, while the numbers are scary, there are reports that between 2 and 21 million people may require hospitalization. And on any given day, there are only a million staffed hospital beds in the United States. So the real important thing here is to spread things out over time. We have the capacity to care for everyone if they're coming in over a longer period of time. But it obviously becomes more difficult if everyone is becoming sick all at once. So every hospital, both in the state of New Hampshire and around the country, is working on plans to help cope for any increases in patients and to be able to provide the care that is needed. I did want to talk briefly about mortality because I think people get very worried about the number, and it is a scary number that's out there. It's definitely higher than what we see with more common respiratory viruses such as influenza, um, but oftentimes what is reported um, in the media is the case fatality rate which is those um, who are dying amongst uh, those we know to be positive. And we know that there's a large number who are asymptomatic or mildly asymptomatic and not being tested. And if you include those, the actual infection fatality rate um, goes down. Um, it's still about 0.5% or 1 in 200. So I don't mean to minimize that number, um, but it is a lower number than you may be seeing um, in some reports. There was a um, nice opinion piece that was written today um, about how we're all scared and even healthcare workers are scared. And it's hard to not, you know, look at these numbers and not be scared, but I think it's really a time uh, for all of us to step up and change our daily practices. You know, a lot has been talked about us working together and adhering to all of these uh, strict containment policies that have been put in place. If we all adhere to these and do our part, it is actually possible to make a huge difference in the spread of this illness. I think there's a lot of hope out there, but it really means that everyone needs to do their part. So maybe I'll stop there and we can uh, go to the next speaker. Greta, do you want to go ahead and join us? Just remember to unmute your line. We're unmuted on my end. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Rachel Roderick. Um, I work with Greta here. So basically, as um, the congressman pointed out, the SBA um, has issued a disaster declaration that covers the entire state now. So that opens up the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program for businesses throughout the state. And what the program does is it is a working capital loan. It's a direct loan from the Treasury at a low interest rate. It's set at 3.75% um, for as long of a maturity of 30 years, depending on repayment ability. And it's a working capital loan to cover those fixed, fixed expenses that businesses have to carry them over until we get to normal operations again. So we can cover you know, fixed loan payments, payroll, rent, all of those kinds of um, monthly obligations um, for an extended period of time. Um, and right now the the guidelines that the processing center are using, um, you know, they're evaluating the situation and estimating how long they think um, the crisis is going to last, but that can always be adjusted later on as, as things progress and we learn more. So. The application process is open. We're doing daily webinars here in our office, 9 o'clock and 2 o'clock every day to try to get the word out on what the process is and how to apply. We're working with all of our resource partners across the state, um, SCORE, the Small Business Development Center, our Women's Business Center, so that they have the information they need to help small businesses through the process. Um, so that's kind of the outreach that we're doing here and what the loan program is about. Um, 
And I also hi this Could is, you? I also wanted to mention that we've been working with our lenders to make sure they understand what flexibilities they have for anybody with an existing SBA loan in terms of providing some temporary payment relief. And we're working with all of our resource partners to bring them up to speed on all of the economic injury disaster loan program um, benefits and the, the process and the how to apply so that they can better serve our customers as well so that we have more people who can do that one-on-one -on -one assistance. Could you please give the folks on the line the contact information to learn more about these small business programs and particularly about the emergency uh, loans related to the dislocation from the coronavirus? They can always visit our local page, sba.gov slash nh. And if you scroll to the bottom right corner, you can sign up for our e-news blasts, and you will get information about upcoming webinars and sessions and any other ser products or services that come out as we learn about them. And for disaster-specific information, the website is sba.gov slash disaster. Or they can also but, visit the – I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you finished. Okay, or they can also go directly to the application page, which is disasterloan.sba.gov slash ELA, which I believe stands for Electronic Loan Application. So that's disasterloan.sba.gov slash ELA. Great. And for those who may not have access to a computer, is there a telephone number that they could call? Yes. Um, there's a customer service number, which is 1-800-877. Uh, let's see. I just want to make sure I get the right one. I'm sorry. 1-800-659-2955. Or they can call our office, which is 603-225. 1400 and we can get them the there's a paper application that can be mailed in um, which we're not really recommending because it's it, it's faster to do it online but if, if someone doesn't have that opportunity there is a paper application that can be mailed in as well great well thank That's you great. very much you're welcome the other thing I just wanted to mention is that there are automatic deferments on these loans. So, you know, it is a loan and, and it does require a monthly payment, but the agency is doing a minimum of a four-month deferment and, and looking at doing even longer of a deferment. So no one would, would be expected to make any payments on this for it till at least month five, if not longer. Great. That's very helpful. So, moderator, can you open it up to questions? Absolutely. We've got a lot of folks looking to ask a question. If you've just joined recently, you can press star 3 on your phone to ask a question, and we will get a chance to take as many questions as we can live. We're going to start up in the Upper Valley, and Liz, uh, you are live, and you can go ahead with your question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I had an original question about loans. You answered them pretty well for small businesses with hospitality industry. Um, but I also know that interest can add up. Is there any move to have deferred interest as, lo as long as well as deferred payments? Thanks. No, unfortunately, the interest does accrue during the period of time, but only on what's been dispersed. And so it's just factored into how we establish the payment amount. But also, it's simple interest. It only accrues on the, accrues on the amount that's been dispersed. And we don't necessarily have to disperse everything at once. If we're forecasting funds that you're not going to need for three months, we don't need to disperse them right away so they can sit there and accrue interest. And this is Congressman Pappas. I'll say that we're looking to get additional support for our small business community through this economic stimulus package that um, you know, we're working on right now, House and Senate leadership and the White House are in negotiations on what this will look like. Um, but I think we're looking to expand the availability of capital to small businesses, uh, look at things like, um, you know, ensuring that, uh, you know, they can keep their doors open, um, you know, moving forward. I've proposed zero interest loans, and uh, we're hoping to get some support for that as part of this package, too. Um, and so what, whatever the local businesses are in need of, I think we want to make sure that's front and center um, in this upcoming package. I'll say this, we also have an opportunity to talk about 
infrastructure and about how we can think long term about creating some jobs and creating the backbone of economic success for our communities. Um, so I would expect that infrastructure will be a real central piece of this economic stimulus package. So I think there are a lot of tools that we have at our disposal uh, from the tax code, uh, you know, giving tax relief to local businesses. You've heard a lot of talk about uh, cutting direct checks to individuals that can help stimulate our economy. I'll say one of the uh, you know issues with that is um, we don't necessarily have an issue with demand right now. I mean, people would like to get out and shop and go to a restaurant and frequent their Main Street businesses. Uh, the fact is this order that we're under in New Hampshire right now um, and you know what the future uh, potentially looks like uh, prevents people from getting out. So um, direct help is important to make sure that people can meet their basic household expenses, uh, but we also have to think about how we can support the business community in this period uh, through tax relief and loan relief, um, you know, for instance, suspending, um, you know, debt payments and mortgage payments in this period could be very valuable to our local businesses. So that certainly has to be part of the package. And I think you, thank you for raising that issue. Thank you, Congressman. We're going to go next to East Kingston. Uh, Nick, you have a question. Nick, you are live. Hey guys, I just wanted to ask if there was a plan for getting more testing kits into the area. Um, with some of the data coming out of China and Italy indicating that the vast majority of people will be asymptomatic. So as far as getting things back to normal, isn't it important to know, you know everybody who has contracted the virus? So this is uh, Dr. Calder, and I can, I can take that. Um, I agree with that entirely. You know, ideally, we would have... Um, you know, tons of test kits. It's actually not just the test kits themselves. Um, in addition to the test kits, um, you need the swabs for collecting the specimen, the transport media that those swabs go into, and sufficient uh, personal protective equipment um, for the healthcare workers that are doing the specimen collection. And, um, you know, both nationally and internationally, we are having shortages of all of those elements. Um, I can at least give a shout out to the lab here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, I'm very proud. They worked round the clock for uh, two weeks and developed and validated an in-house test that currently has the capacity uh, to do 100 tests per day and has growth potential um, to do 1,000 tests per day. And so the lab here is working to support the state lab and other hospitals in increasing testing capacity. Um, but we're still going to be facing the shortages of the critical supplies that I've mentioned uh, to enable uh, broad testing. So currently, we're really focusing on the testing of hospitalized patients and frontline uh, patient care providers. Others who are sick and not in need of hospitalization, a big focus is on self-isolation um, at home. Um, and so we really do want to focus on if you fall ill, you have to stay in your home, not go out, because you're going to be a big part of not spreading this virus. Um, so while it, test kits are important, I do have to emphasize there are more pieces to that, and I think that's an important thing to know. Thank you, Dr. Calderwood. Um, listen, we have... Uh, a lot of folks would like to ask questions. If you would like to uh, have your question considered and included, please just press star three on your phone. Uh, we're going to go next to Nashua with James. James, you are live with your question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi. Thanks. Appreciate it. So four of us in our house, um, one of my family members is known to have uh, been exposed. Three of us are exhibiting no symptoms. My wife of 30 years is exhibiting symptoms. Every time she coughs, I feel like I'm being punched in the stomach. Um, it took us three days working through her doctor to get a test. And I know this relates back to we don't have enough test kits. But, you know, when you turn on the TV and you see asymptomatic athletes and, and uh, celebrities, no problem getting tests, I got a problem with that. And, you know, I just want to make my congresswoman know that. And, uh, and I know you probably agree with me. So I just want to let that be known. And then, um, you know, I live in Nashua, and there's quite a few homeless people. And um, I hope that we maybe can open up a high school gymnasium so they can get some social spacing and not get more people in themselves sicker. So that's what I got. I appreciate you guys being on the line and talking to us. 
Well, thank you for calling in, and and, uh, my heart does go out to you and to your wife, and I'm glad that she uh, finally was able to get the testing. I do share your frustration. Um, We, as I said, started beating the drum on this close to a month ago when Secretary Azar testified before my committee in Congress, the House Health Subcommittee, and it was clear from the very beginning that there were going to be problems with the testing. Um, And as uh, Dr. Calderwood now has mentioned, it goes beyond the actual testing. It's the um, supplies and materials that are required to uh, take the test, the swabs and such, and uh, send them to the lab. And then obviously the personnel issues to make sure the labs are up and running. So I am very concerned because we have a catch-22 now where there are people that have been exposed and they are self-isolating at home, and we appreciate that. That's critically important. But to the extent that they have symptoms and need testing, uh, that's crucial because otherwise the hospitals have to assume that there are people in the community that have been exposed that might expose their healthcare workers. And the catch-22 is that then the hospital has to use another precious resource that we haven't talked about is called PPE, and it's the personal protecting protection equipment. They have to use that not knowing whether or not a patient that comes into the hospital might have been exposed. And I think Maybe, Dr. Colwood, if you could speak to the challenges of COVID-19 and the fact of the possibility of being spread when someone is asymptomatic before they show um, before they show symptoms. And then to the caller, I will definitely follow up with the mayor as soon as we get off this call. You've raised a really important question about uh, homeless people in Nashua, and I'll, I'll make sure to give uh, Mayor Donches a call and uh, talk about the plan for that with him. But Dr. Colbert, if you could address that issue of uh, the contagion, even from a person that is not symptomatic. Yes, and so I mean this is this is important. And um, what we know is that the contagious uh, kind of period probably starts um, about 24 hours um, before symptoms, but there are some that have very mild symptoms um, and not even think much of it. There is a lot of discussion about um, how infectious uh, those individuals are versus um, people who are actively coughing and more likely to spread. In general, it is thought that one infected person will spread to two to three other uh, people in the community, and this is how we get to exponential growth. I agree, and I suspect we will get Uh, more questions about this, that ideally we would have the capacity uh, to test um, everyone. We are in an unprecedented time in terms of shortages of uh, critical um, healthcare equipment. And as we begin to think about uh, the ability of hospitals to begin admitting patients, you know, we start to think about availability of ventilators and We're doing a lot of work to really increase those numbers and be forward thinking um, as we plan uh, for surges that may may come. We obviously hope that they don't increase um, as much as projections might suggest, but we don't want to be uh, going into this blind and at least be planning for that. The one that I think really um, has been a big focus is the shortages on um, masks and gloves and gowns and, and other things that are needed to protect uh, the frontline healthcare workers. There's a, a big discussion around those who are exposed and how long they need to be out on quarantine. But you, the more people you have out on quarantine, the fewer healthcare workers you have that can be in the hospital providing the care. And so this is the balance that we're trying to strike. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Look, we've had a lot of folks who've asked questions online, and I think one of them is really relevant. Uh, Kathleen is uh, asking a question that I think uh, parents around the state uh, would love to hear you guys' answer. She has asked, what message do you have for the state's students and teachers uh, as they embark on remote learning? 
Well, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Congressman Custer here. I think the message for everyone is this is a tremendous upheaval of life as we know it. Uh, but I would expect as we go forward in time and look back on this era, we will have some pretty substantial um, changes. And one of those is the role of technology in our life. And whether it's online learning or teleworking, telecommuting that so many of us are doing now. Um, but the online learning, I guess my message just as a parent is have patience. Uh, have patience with your children and your students and have patience with our teachers. This all happened rather dramatically in some cases. Uh, some people were off on their spring break and I know certainly college students that were just simply told don't come back and they're having to make a very swift adjustment. Some of the schools were in the same position where the kids were sent home and then the next communication from the school was don't come back, you'll be learning at home. So I do know uh, from conversations with the governor that there has been quite a bit of thought put into this in New Hampshire leading up to this and the concept of distance learning and the training for teachers. Uh, but obviously there's going to be an adjustment period. There's going to be an adjustment period for people to get access to the technology. And I want to just give a short shout out. We have been doing a lot of work in my uh, energy and commerce committee, which is where the telecommunications is considered, on the issue of rural broadband access. I actually serve on a task force with uh, Mr. Clyburn, the majority whip, about rural broadband access. And I expect in this third legislative package that we will have initiatives and funding to make sure that every student here in New Hampshire and across this country can get access to distance learning. Because that, that would be the biggest shame is if somehow there were students that were left behind that they could not um, could not get access. In the meantime, I think we have to give our teachers the support and the opportunity to step up and to be able to offer instruction in a meaningful way to young people all across the state. And I know it's a struggle for families. I know it's a, it's personally can be a struggle just juggling work and family in the same house. But um, there's also other opportunities for learning, and we've all got to sort of step back and slow down, and whether it's uh, cooperating with each other on uh, just the making of meals or the chores that need to be done around the house or some creative efforts on passing the time, uh, getting outdoors, that's always an opportunity that's safe if you practice your social distancing. And certainly we're heading into spring and children can learn so much about nature and this beautiful state that we live in. So I think having an open mind, uh, being patient, and be, becoming curious learners, all of us, uh, all of us need to learn this is going to be a major transition in our society and uh, we've got to try to look, look for the silver linings where we can find them. And this is Chris Pappas. I'd just like to add, um, you know, my support and appreciation for all of our educators and school professionals and parents that have really made this system work as best as it possibly can, um, you know, and they're looking forward to, you know, how they can t continue to support our kids moving forward. I know here in Manchester where I live, you know, the city has been sending out buses uh, with lunches and lesson plans to make sure that uh, parents have uh, that, uh, you know, those resources to take care of their kids. Um, and there's some good resources online, too, at the New Hampshire Department of Education. If you go to education.nh.gov, uh, you can find out some of the details about remote learning, um, some best practices for parents, uh, as well as, uh, you know, some opportunities that are out there. I know you know, access to internet uh, is one critical issue for families. And I think, uh, you know, there's an opportunity there to be connected with some free internet for remote learning. Um, so I would encourage everyone to check out those resources if they have any questions. Thank you, Congressman Wayne. You've been, uh, you've been patiently waiting. Uh, you are now live. Go ahead with your question, Wayne. 
Uh, Chris and Ian, thank you very much for doing what you're doing. Um, my my issue is uh, I was just laid, laid off this past week uh, when uh, when the uh, the statement came down to close restaurants and have applied for unemployment. Uh, was helped very much by the by the local office in Conway, but my problem now is the fact that I don't have a computer. Uh, the office is closed, as are the libraries where I would be able to access a computer. Uh, and hopefully there's a way that I can reapply, which you have to do every week, uh, over the phone. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person in this situation because they, the office was open on Tuesday in Conway, and then it was closed the next day. So um, that's my issue, and hopefully you guys will come up with a, with some help. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for the question. This is an unfortunate situation that thousands of Granite Staters are in right now, and I know that the systems at New Hampshire Employment Security have been overwhelmed. They've tried to set up a kind of a, an alphabetical situation where uh, certain times of day people uh, who have last names beginning with a certain letter can apply for unemployment benefits. Um, and if you do have access to the internet, you can go to uh, the New Hampshire Employment Security website um, at nhes.nh.gov uh, to uh, both find out about how to apply and actually do it online. Um, but in the absence of, um, you know, access to a computer, I would just uh, urge you to call my office. We're happy to figure out a way to connect you. You can reach us at 935-6710, and um, we can, you know, make sure that you get access to a computer near you uh, to apply online, and we can connect you to the office. There have been a number of steps that the state has taken and orders that the governor has issued with respect to employment um, and un unemployment in New Hampshire, um, both, you know, one critical step was getting rid of the waiting week so that uh, individuals won't have to wait a week to start collecting benefits, um, and also, um, you know, rules that deal with, um, you know, individuals who are self-employed or sole proprietors who will have access to unemployment benefits in our state. So there are a number of changes that have been made for the better uh, to help, you know, promote the economic security of individuals in our state. Um, and at the federal level, we've been, you know, making sure that the support is there for New Hampshire's uh, employment, unemployment uh, trust fund to make sure that it remains solvent to pay out the benefits that people need during this period. So, um, Wayne, just give a call to our office and we'll find a way to, to get you connected with the folks at Employment Security so you can file your claim. All right. We are going to head out to Steve in Manchester. Steve, thank you for patiently waiting and you are live. Yes, uh, this question is for Dr. Calder and also Representative Pappas. I'm a uh, Vietnam vet. My primary care physician is in the uh, VA Manchester area. Uh, I've done some uh, studies on uh, zinc ions uh, being able to inhibit the coronavirus reproduction in infected uh, cells. So I take uh, 50 milligrams of zinc a day, well below the toxicity uh, level. But um, you need, in order to transfer it, you need a, what's called an ionophore that transfers the zinc ions into the cells. Well, hydroxychloroquine, a malaria drug, is well tolerated and is also a ionophore. And it's a benign side effects, well tolerated. What I would ask is that uh, the VA be allowed to prophylactically and voluntarily uh, uh, prescribe uh, that drug as a ionophore to uh, help prevent or at least uh, negate the effects of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, the objective would be that all infected people would uh, stop shedding uh, coronaviruses and to ask for your opinion. Thank you. Sure. This is Dr. Calderwood. Um, there's been a lot of media in the past couple of days about hydroxychloroquine. Um, it's a drug that um, is off and on in shortage and is actually needed um, as part of a long-term treatment regimen for um, a number of patients um, with things like lupus and other diseases. Um, as we, as the healthcare system, think about the regimens that we're gonna have available for patients hospitalized with severe disease, um, this is one of the drugs uh, that we're going to need as part of that regimen. I will say that um, right now, there is insufficient hydroxychloroquine um, to 
continue to prescribe for those who are on it for maintenance therapy for their chronic illness and we're not able to get it in hospitals. And part of what we're seeing, particularly with the media over the last two days, is a lot of people are running out and asking their primary care physician for a just-in-case prescription to keep at home. And what that's uh, having an impact on is that hospitals are no longer able to get this drug. So I feel very strongly that primary care physicians should not be prescribing this drug. Thank you, Dr. Calderwood. Uh, again, we are being joined today by Congressman Pappas, Congresswoman Custer. That was Dr. Michael Calderwood from Dartmouth-Hitchcock. We're now going to go to Becky. Becky, you are now live on the call. Hello? That's you. Okay. Go ahead, Becky. Uh, You're live. Hi. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Congressman Pappas and Congresswoman Custer, and also the doctor and Ms. Johansson for doing this call. Um, I was on the last call and I felt reassured for about an hour and then of course I watched the news for the following week and, and I'm just as freaked out now as I was then. Um, so as a small business, um, you know, we're obviously concerned. Um, you've answered some of my questions about when we run out of money, uh, what do we do and you, you introduce the low to no interest loans and, and all of that. Um, so I guess uh, my next Two questions that are really important to me right now is, as we go forward and when we start to run out of money and we can't pay our employees anymore, do we continue to pay for our commercial package insurance, our health insurance, because we pay our employees health insurance, the majority of it? Um, and then the second part of that question is property tax, which will be due in uh, what, July 1st or maybe June 1st, um, are those going to be deferred or put on hold or, uh, you know, because that's for a lot of people that live in New Hampshire, as you know, that's thousands and thousands of dollars every six months. Um, so those are my two questions. And then um, to the gentleman that just spoke before me about the hydroxychloroquine, I have systemic lupus and I, I got a prescription filled a week ago, which will last me about another month. And I just heard the doctor say that because of all this um, information now about the hydroxychloroquine, now I'm concerned it's not gonna be available to me on top of my totally freaked out brain thinking I'm gonna get coronavirus. Um, so that's frightening. Um, all of this is very frightening. And I've been calling to check on my neighbors who are, who are also very frightened. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Becky, Thank you. for your raising those issues. And you've touched on so many of the concerning points of this epidemic, both how it impacts us uh, personally, uh, professionally, in terms of our, our you know, businesses and where we work, um, as well as the greater community impacts. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, for us moving forward in this um, economic stimulus package that I spoke of, we have to look for relief, um, especially in the tax code uh, for local businesses, so that um, those who are carrying payrolls and are paying the benefits of their workers um, get relief to be able to keep moving forward. In terms of state taxes, uh, you know, like state property taxes, for instance, or, uh, you know, our business profits tax or business and enterprise tax, um, as a federal official, I can't answer those questions and, and don't really know, you know, what direction the state might go in. Um, but I know Congressman Custer and I talk regularly with the governor. Um, I was talking to him yesterday about state revenues that have taken a tremendous hit based on the number of business closures that we've already seen. Um, and we will continue to urge him uh, to think prudently about, um, you know, how he can support businesses. I know he created a fund uh, just yesterday that uh, businesses and our hospitals can apply for support from. Um, and so that is another tool that's out there. But I didn't know if, if Greta and Rachel over at SBA might have some uh, additional advice for Becky. Uh, <laughs> no, um, no, we're, other than we're making a note of the questions and we, we, I think we'll be able to get back to you through, um, through our representatives, Custer or Pappas. And if we come up with something, uh, we'll have that for you. And other than that, stay tuned because new stuff rolls out almost hourly. 
and and I I I can't imagine what it's like to be in your shoes. And I wish I had an answer for you today, but I really don't. Okay. Well, maybe we'll look to connect uh, Becky uh, with with you, Greta, uh, over at SBA, and um, perhaps continue the conversation there. So thanks. Absolutely. Feel free to give us a call at uh, 225-1400 or call me directly at 1401. So, folks, we've got thousands of people online, as you might expect. There's so much to talk about. We're going to get to as many questions as we can over here over the course of the next 20 minutes. Uh, we're going to go to Susan in Portsmouth. Susan, uh, go ahead with your question. You are live. My question is about the wonderful workers who are keeping our supermarkets open so that we can eat. However, they all have families, and they're out all day long exposed. So for those of us who are home who are trying to be isolated, what do we do with family members who are coming home and, um, yes, washing their hands and exposing us? I am a, I'm in my mid-70s. I have underlying health conditions. I have a housemate who works six days a week at the supermarket, and I'm so appreciative that she does, she's keeping the supermarket open. However, we have our own bedrooms. Fortunately, I have a big enough house so that we have our own bathrooms, but we do share a kitchen. And I'm wondering what else people who are out every day coming home to their families, what else people can be doing to help keep their families safe? <clears throat> So this is Dr. Calderwood. Thank you. That's a, that's a very important question, and I, I have similar uh, concerns and am similarly grateful for everyone who's hel helping to keep some of these stores open that we really need uh, to maintain our daily lives. You know, I think this really speaks to the fact that this is beyond one individual, and this is going to take the work of the entire community working as one. And so those who are out working at grocery, uh, grocery stores um, are only as safe as the individual shopping, remembering that they shouldn't be there if they are sick and coughing or having a fever, that there are options for um, ordering uh, groceries for delivery or for having others uh, go and do the shopping and bring it to you. Um, but if you are out in the community when you're sick, you are putting others at risk. For the person working uh, in the grocery store, um, obviously hand hygiene, hand washing, um, either with an alcohol-based hand rub or with soap and water is going to be critical, um, and doing that regularly. Um, and, um, you know, when they are handling money, when they are um, uh, having any interaction, we do want to limit things like handshaking um, so that we're not transmitting things. Those are the things in the workplace things can do. At home, um, you know, it is really, again, about hand washing and respiratory etiquette. But one thing we focus on at home is if you're feeling ill, how can you separate yourself from others in the home environment um, and try not to share the same spaces? It really is a six-foot distance, um, and it doesn't go beyond that. Uh, but some people will say, okay, do I sleep in a different room when I'm not feeling well? There are things, and the CDC has some wonderful websites um, kind of talking about this and how you can keep others safe. So I would point you towards that. Thank you, Dr. Calderwood. Uh, we're going to go back to Nashua. Mark in Nashua, uh, you are live. Go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, Representatives Custer and Pappas. Uh, this is Mark Thornton from Nashua, New Hampshire, and I want to thank you, first of all, for your tireless work in support of the citizens of this state. Thank you very much for that. My question and comment really relates to those who are perhaps the most vulnerable and often neglected in, in, our, in our society, and those are the individuals who have intellectual and developmental disabilities, acquired brain disorder, uh, veterans who have uh, PTSD and so forth. Uh, many of, of the issues that, that I'm concerned about relate to this group. Uh, and recent legislation, which we are very grateful for, uh, has had some glaring omissions. Uh, for example, the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, did provide exemptions for health care providers under paid sick leave. However, it did not include direct service providers, and these are the individuals who are in the front line of caring for our uh, population on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And uh, I know the Department of Labor has the ability to declare them and deem them health care providers, but to the best of my knowledge, that has not yet happened. My question is, uh, what what steps are being taken to ensure that that the that this population is is addressed in in legislation coming up or the agencies that support them are addressed to allow them to be supported 24/7 as they are uh, as they are required. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you so much for bringing that up and let me just say that um in the conference call yesterday we did have the state um organization the disabilities rights agency was with us on the line and um but this is a very important point that you've brought up and um i will say that chris and i will take this right back to the delegation we can write a letter to try to get those uh frontline uh disability act uh, workers covered under the language we can also take steps um, with our colleagues to try to get a corrective amendment in upcoming legislation so i appreciate you bringing this to our attention and we will pursue this uh, because i completely agree with you that you know we were hearing about the home health aides that are taking care of people with severe disabilities uh, we also had nami new hampshire and new futures we were talking with families about mental health and treatment for mental health and for addiction we know here in new hampshire we have a very um high big challenge that we've been dealing with now close to a decade about opioid uh misuse and opioid use disorder um we have alcohol addiction as well and so we need to make sure that these services continue to be available to people in need we're in a very stressful environment uh, i've had some contact with the coalition against domestic and sexual violence knowing that um, for many of us it, it is a place of safety to be uh, working or studying from home but for some people that's torturous that's not a place of safety and they need to know that our uh, agencies to protect from domestic violence and sexual assault will be available. So I appreciate you bringing up this point and this is one that we can take back and try to get a quick fix. Thank you representative Coster. We're going to go over to Barrington. Uh William, you've been William, you've been patiently waiting. You are now live. Go ahead with your question. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I um listening to other people's issues and sometimes that I you know, maybe mine is not as uh, as important uh as to the point that uh if uh Congresswoman Kasser just brought up. But uh so anyways my here's my, my issue. I'm I'm a physical therapist. I own a physical therapy practice in, in Rochester. And um we had a couple of employees um sick uh, not and, and, and they and we had to close our close our practice because of that to be to be responsible. And uh, we want to keep taking care of our patients and uh, using telehealth for that. And um, unfortunately, um, there are a couple of telehealth expansions out there, but uh, physical therapy seems to be um, left off of that. For example, uh, Medicare allows for e-visits, which is really not that meaningful. If they're very short visits or only seven days total. And uh, then there's uh, the New Hampshire expansion which leaves off physical therapy and occupational therapy. So I was wondering what uh, what what you guys thought about that. Again, thank you. Um, what happens sometimes, I'll say, when, when we're working uh, around the clock to get a timely response, um, there are issues that need to be corrected in legislation, and this is another one that's very helpful I have been talking with physical therapists about the challenges they face in having to close down their practice. And I certainly know um, even close friends recently having surgery who need physical therapy and some people need it for chronic pain. Um, so I think this is one where we will work with your state association. You should be talking with them to make sure they're talking to the governor and the state legislature. Um, on the second part of your question, but certainly on the federal piece, this is again something that 
we can take back, as I mentioned, I do sit on the House Health Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. We're having a full committee conference call this afternoon about this third package of legislation, and we could um, see if we could get a fix for that uh, in, in this package or the next. So I say the next because I anticipate that as we go forward, both the health challenges and the economic challenges uh, will require additional um, legislation and appropriation uh, until we get to a place, hopefully not too far in the distant future, where uh, we can get our, our lives and our economy back on track. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, let's get to one more question. Let's head out to New London. Uh, Sean, you've been waiting for the better part of an hour. Thank you for your patience, and you are now live on the conversation. Go ahead. Hey, thanks, uh, and thanks to all who are taking the time to help us with this. Uh, uh, two questions. First is with the uh, PPE, as a primary care clinician, uh, we're struggling to get uh, PPE, and we're doing backdoor visits, so folks drive by, but we just don't have the supplies, and I'd love to find out if there's some way we could get access to the strategic reserves or if um, we could get some process where we're getting the equipment into primary care and the hospitals, et cetera, rather than going on to the grocery shelves. Um, the other is um, half of a local machine shop was laid off um, this week, which means they're going to be on unemployment. But what's the process for all these folks that are unemployed to have health insurance? Uh, it's a huge anxiety for the folks that are coming through here that are now suddenly yeah. facing additional stressors. So thank you. Uh, I can certainly take the second part, and then we can turn it back to Dr. Calderwood on the first. Um, in terms of health insurance for the unemployed, we are looking to reopen and have an open enrollment on uh, Medicaid, uh, the Medicaid expansion that we have here in New Hampshire. Thank goodness we do. There are still states across this country that don't have uh, the expansion of Medicaid. Um, but if you have individual uh, cases, this might be a good time to put in a plug. People can certainly reach out to, uh, to my office um, if they have questions or individual casework where they need help with an individual situation. Uh, Custer, K-U-S-T-E-R dot house dot gov or in Concord, 603-226-1002. I can take the, the first part, although then I um, may push it back to our elected officials. The um, issue around um, PPE and the uh, strategic uh, stockpile is one that uh, keeps coming up and um, where those resources are going. And obviously we have early states who've uh, had much more of an impact on the West Coast, but now we're beginning to see large impacts on the East Coast, and all states will um, begin uh, to face uh, larger and larger numbers. The issue around PPE in, in primary care um, is absolutely an important one. I think we can think about um, whether that's the place where we should be doing uh, testing or whether we should strategize. Um, around testing for those um, who are uh, critically ill through some mobile test uh, sites that hospitals and states have stood up. It is a struggle, though, um, and what we know is that the uh, shelves are, are bare. And if you go shopping, they're bare from many things. But early on in this, um, there was uh, stockpiling of gloves and masks um, in individuals' homes. And we're at a point now where some health systems are reaching out to the communities and saying, if you have these in your home, we are in desperate need. And um, so I think we need to look both to uh, strategic stockpiles, but also to what might be available in the community. Uh, and again, this is back to the statement of we are all one. Thank you, Dr. Calderwood. Uh, Congressman Pappas, Congresswoman Custer, any final comments that you would like to share with your constituents? Well, sure. We, we just really appreciate um, everyone's time here, and we know that there were many more questions um, than we had uh, time for to answer today, but please know that our offices are ready uh, to answer your calls, your emails, 
um, and help you with any issues that you might be experiencing. Um, our Manchester office line is 285-4300, and you can find us online at pappas.house.gov. Uh, please reach out to us, and we would love to continue to hear your thoughts, your concerns, and how we can best assist you at this point in time. And I think it can't go without saying um, that this is a time where we have to uh, rise above our differences, uh, look out for vulnerable members in our community, and all understand that we have a role to play in the response, both to protect ourselves and our own families, but also our community at large. And um, we're going to be back at it next week in Washington and hopefully addressing uh, the economic circumstances that this nation is facing already and is going to face over the next many months. Um, and we'd appreciate your thoughts and your ideas uh, in that process, too. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Congresswoman Custer for some closing comments. Thank you, Chris. And, and thank you to everybody that was on the line and stayed on the line. Uh, it, please do give your question to the operators. Uh, thanks to our staff for being available um, uh, over the phone to take your questions. Uh, clearly, this is something that's been worthwhile and helpful, and we will do it again. Uh, as I said, we had a successful telephone town hall last week. Uh, this is clearly a lot of important questions this week. I want to genuinely thank Dr. Calderwood and, and really to every frontline uh, healthcare professional in the state, uh, from the nurses and staff to the physicians. Um, we could not be facing this without you. We know you're putting your lives at risk and, and your families uh, when you come home in the evening. And we here's our pledge to you. You are serving us on the front lines. We can serve you by staying home, uh, making sure that we are doing all of our personal hygiene. I don't know about the rest of you. My hands are about washed raw. But uh, I think we just have to thoroughly and frequently be washing our hands, wiping down counters. Uh, if you have any sign of illness, please do not leave your home. Do not put other people at risk. And uh, if you um, do have signs of illness, contact your own healthcare professional and follow their advice very carefully. Um, I think, as Chris pointed out, uh, we both want to make ourselves available to you. We have compassion for the situation that you're in, um, and we want to help you to solve your individual problems. So if you need help, don't hesitate to reach us. Again, our website, custer.house.gov, and our Concord, New Hampshire office, 603-226-1002. If you do have questions about the legislation or would like to make recommendations for amendments or for provisions in the legislation, feel free to reach out to our Washington, D.C. office, 202-225-5206. I want to thank all of our staff who are working from home as well, but uh, definitely keeping the trains running here. And I just want to close by saying uh, this is certainly the most challenging time in my lifetime. I, I think most people on the call will feel the same way, perhaps, uh, except for those that were on the front lines in a war. Um, but this is a war of our own, and we need to pull together. And I would just ask you to be patient with the, those you love and be generous with those in need, and together uh, we are one, and we will come out of this stronger. So Chris and I will be scheduling another telephone town hall. Uh, if we didn't get to your question today, uh, please join us again next time, and thank you. Uh, God bless to all of you, and uh, Dr. Calderwood, if you have any closing comments. Sure. I just wanted to cover one thing that we didn't uh, get to and I think is important. There's obviously a lot of uh, fear and stress, and we have to be thoughtful about um, how this may be impacting uh, children um, in the home. And there's a lot of resources out there about how you speak um, with children about um, these sorts of events. But I think, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have that stress and you shouldn't be fearful, but we have to be careful as we go home how we show that and help, how we help our children to understand that 
because um, a lot are carrying both the burden now of being out of school, but also the burden of what does this mean? And so I think we need to understand that conversation. Thank you, Dr. Calderwood, and thank you for all the residents of uh, New Hampshire who have participated today. We have come to the end of our town hall for this afternoon, and we do appreciate you taking the time for this very important update on the coronavirus. Please stay safe, and bye-bye.